am on the faculty in the Department of Neurology at USC, and I'm also the coordinator at USC for the Parkinson Foundation Center of Excellence. The Parkinson Foundation funds a number of wonderful things, and the Center of Excellence program has been very beneficial and, in fact, allows us to do some of the things that we do for our, our patients and our community. Also here with us today in a little bit is Chris Mendenhall. She is a Parkinson Foundation patient research advocate, which is a, a real designation. The Parkinson Foundation is always very interested in the perspective of the patient. And the, we are also joined today by Wendy Lang, who has been a participant in this particular investigation. So thank you, Sarah. We'll move on. One of the things I, I, we always start with is our disclosures, whether we're getting money from a pharmaceutical company or whatever. And in this case, the disclosures are that we exercise. I exercise, I'm one of the pictured folks here. This is a wonderful picture of Chris Mendenhall in her 5K training team shirt and a picture of Wendy next to an ad for a 5K. She's out at one of our training sessions, outdoor training sessions, pre-COVID. Uh, so anyhow, we all, we all exercise. Um, we can go ahead. And then for starters here, when people talk about research, I think most often they talk, they think of a pill or maybe they think of doing a survey. And this is what Sarah Osborne and I were talking about as we we're putting this together. But actually, Parkinson disease research participation can take many forms. Uh, the Parkinson Foundation supports pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic research. And by the way, if you're interested in the pharmacologic and other research that they fund, their site has a lot of information about those, just mentioning that. Okay, Sarah. We're gonna talk a little bit about um, research basics and it's kind of an aside, but since we kind of nationally have had a seminar on research, watching the vaccine research play out, we've all learned about preclinical research, which is before you get to people. And then we've learned about the early phases where we are testing the vaccine in just a few people to see if it's safe uh, and to see if it stimulates a response. And now, actually as of last Friday, I didn't check today, as of last Friday, there were nine vaccines in the phase three clinical trials where we are actually giving vaccine, as you probably know, to a lot of people. Um, one of the things that we need to keep in mind is that we sh science evolves. What we know today may change. It's a little bit tricky because some science has become a little political, but I advise you to look at the real science to please investigate things and look at the primary sources. Um, and so we should expect that it will evolve, but evolve in a scientific way. So, so we're gonna get back to our study. Our study is not actually any of those kinds of studies that we've just talked about for vaccines. We call this an investigation. And the fundamental issue that I'm interested in, and one that we all know about is, how to get people to exercise. And the, uh, we, we read that uh, the research, uh, when, that the challenge, pardon me, is not to figure out which dose of physical activity to prescribe, but rather how to get more people to adopt the actions that researchers know work. So this is a real issue. This is the Academy of Medicine quote. And it, it, that's, the tough, that's the tough issue. So our investigation of trackers sort of is very related to that fundamental issue. And Sarah, would you please show the cartoon? All right, so I've spent a lot of words talking about what we're interested in. And Roz Chast, who's a fantastic New Yorker cartoonist, has said the whole thing in seven words. It's called the mind-body problem. The speech bubble above the guy's head says, get up, and the speech bubble above his midsection says, no. So that is, a, that is a very basic problem, and we all know it, and this is just a wonderful way of expressing it. Um, and so I'm gonna go on to our focused problem. So we have the issue of 
helping people be motivated to exercise. And the question arose, will a physically, physical activity tracker help? So there's not much precedent for using physical activity trackers in the population that is part of the 5K team. So we launched what's called, what we called an investigation. It, it, would, be, uh, it would be too soon to launch a clinical trial. So we launched an investigation. And the aim of our problem, we wanted to find out, we wanted to know more about using physical activity trackers in a population of folks who have Parkinson disease. So we started this, here's the title of our, of our investigation. An investigation of tracking technology in the setting of an established exercise program for individuals with Parkinson's disease. And it's, it was a 10 month program, which is a long time. And so I'm, what I'm gonna do now is get onto the background a little bit, because I said we, we based this investigation on folks who are already members of the 5K tra training team. And the 5K training team is folks that are generally older, and have generally had Parkinson's disease for a period of time. So there's sometimes more challenges. And I want just to acknowledge that there are some other investigations uh, using uh, trackers to figure out how you're doing with your medications or to investigate new medications. This really was a program designed to help people who are on the 5K team be get out more, exercise more. So let's introduce the 5K team in pictures. All right, there, here we are. And uh, I want you all to just share a little bit in the uh, good spirits of the 5K training team. Here we are, we are at moving day in October, 2016. Most of us are wearing our trademark 5K training team t-shirts. And uh, we're out there, uh, as you can see, there's the Parkinson Foundation uh, inflatable, having a great time. And let's move on, Sarah. Because I also want to point out that we do enter community 5K training team events. And here we are at a 5K in 2017 at, with our numbers on. And there's some advantages, uh, not they're not great for everybody, but they do offer cheers, support, medals, uh, your time. There's a lot of sort of external motivators that come with joining a 5K race. Not everybody, it's not for everybody, but it definitely uh, can, can really work for some of us. And so here we are, we're having a great time. And then I think we have another, another picture of us, and here we are in uh, 2020. We went to Zoom. We just said, okay, well, it is what it is. We're gonna go to Zoom. I'm very optimistic since we are, I think, moving up a tier in Los Angeles that the tiers are in California. We have tiers where we can do various things. Uh, I'm very optimistic that we'll be able to resume our outside training uh, in, in time to, to, before it gets, before the holidays. So that's, that's the plan. I think that uh, Zoom is great. And we loved having Zoom, but we love being face-to-face -face even better. I think that's no surprise. All right, so now I'm gonna get into the nuts and bolts a little bit of this, of this study. First, of course, we started with a literature review, which you always do. And there is quite a literature on use of trackers uh, and the use of apps. And I looked at all of that. There's less research for folks who are older. And there is definitely less research that's long-term. So what you are most interested in, it's all, always good to know that something works for six weeks. What's good for promoting really long-term, years and years of participation? And by the way, the 5K training team has been meeting seasonally. We don't meet in the summer, it's too hot. But it's been meeting seasonally since 2010. Uh, and so I'm interested in some, an adjunct to that experience long-term, but there's not enough literature for us to do a trial, for us to hand out trackers to people and say, here, 
let's see if this works better for some people than for others and things like that. We launched this investigation. And the first thing we wanted to do was to find out what's the best tracker to use. Because too many of our people have trouble with fine motor skills and eyesight, we, did not, we decided not to use uh, an app. So we said, we're gonna use a tracker. Some of those trackers, we can use one of those. So we looked around and there are some, if you have a lot of money to spend, there's some very fancy, wonderful trackers. But we didn't. Uh, Parkinson's Foundation was very generous, but we also felt that we didn't wanna start with something that was so precious that we got nervous about it. So we looked around and we found a tracker that is inexpensive, you just buy it on Amazon. And very important, it's waterproof and it doesn't require charging. So the Fitbit in the drawer story does not have to apply here. Every year you put in a new watch type battery, so that's all you do. The other thing that was kind of special about our particular group is that we recruited our volunteers, our participants from our existing group. So we did not actually put out a call to ask people far and wide to participate. So it was somewhat of a, a closed group. I'm now going to actually introduce Chris Mendenhall. Chris has been with this investigation since the beginning. She's uh, been extremely valuable to us throughout the process. And once again, I want to call out the Parkinson Foundation for making sure that we always have some patient perspective. So uh, with that, Chris is also a, uh, an attorney. And she's actually, uh, I said we were an older group. Chris is, Chris is young. So with that, I want to introduce Chris to tell us a little bit about her perspective. Hi everybody, um, I'm Chris and uh, as Sarah said, I'm an attorney, but luckily that's not what I'm gonna talk about today. I'm gonna talk about how I sometimes feel like the guy on the couch, although I like exercise and I think it's kind of one of our best medicines for Parkinson's. Um, I don't always exercise as much as I think I should. And so I was happy to be part of the group that got to participate in this research. Um, and, and asking to talk about it, I thought, um, I would go back to my advocacy training and sort of parcel it out as to what you do at the beginning, middle, and end of a research project. And so I, to simplify it, used the word it, and I said the first thing you have to do is to figure it out, the next thing you have to do is to do it, and then you're going to check at the end to see what the results were, and most importantly, you want to enjoy it. And those things all came together in this study that we did. Um, first of all, in figuring it out, um, for me, I'm not, I am a little bit older and I'm not so tech savvy all the time. So there was a little anxiety with getting the device on, but we were assisted by other people who were good at it. So first we had to get the device on so that we could wear it properly, make sure it fits, was comfortable. Um, two, what information could you get? So when you get these tracking devices, you often connect to an internet site and it will tell you what information you can get. So in this case, we were able to get information on how many steps we took, um, how we compared to other people in the similar range, what kind of sleep patterns we had. So there was a lot of good information that was online and you had to be able to check into that. Um, one issue that did come in is sometimes rebooting that would be a challenge, but eventually we would figure it out and it would be updated and you could get current information. And I think that was helpful and motivating because you could look and see where you compared to people in your age group, or you could even be part of your group communications and someone would say, wow, you did 10,000 steps. How did this happen? Um, so it's important, first of all, to be fully informed as to what's happening with whatever pill or exercises your uh, study is undertaking. Uh, next, you have to do it. So you had to be sure to actually wear the device. Um, for me, as Sarah noted, um, it was waterproof and I like to swim, so that was a good thing for me because I wouldn't have to take it off. And also when you shower, you don't have to take it off. And two, uh, you don't have to charge it. And I tend to sometimes forget things when I take them off. And so we could keep this on and my battery lasted for over a year. So that was a big benefit to me. Um, three, after, and also as, and I thought I did a pill study when I was first diagnosed almost 10 years ago. And so I was thinking of that as you go through it, things sometimes get modified. So you might have some changes in your dosage and 
or what type of exercise or what you're checking up on or how you interact with people. So I think it's always good to have an open mind when you're in a study because things might be changed during the course of the study. And there were a few changes during this one. Um, next, at the end, you want to be sure you actually ask about the results. What did we learn? I think wearing the tracker did help many of us get stay involved that we might not otherwise have done. So we actually got off the couch and did the exercise because we knew we were connecting with other people and we could see, you know, how does my sleep compare to the general population or to my specific population? Um, so there was motivation to continue to use it. It was easy to wear, et cetera. Um, and finally, I think in terms of any study, you want to be fully informed, but you want to enjoy it. And I think we did because we learned something about technology that some of us didn't know and we felt successful in actually getting it to work and checked up on the results. Um, so I've always been a big proponent of exercise and if this is a way to help people be motivated and continue in participating in exercise, uh, I think this was a very successful study. So. I was happy to be part of it, and I hope you all get a chance to participate in research you think will help the community. So that's it for me. <laughs> We're going, to, here we are. Um, so, oh, very good. So we are gonna spend just a moment looking at sort of the final result. This is a poster that we presented at the American Academy of Neurology actually about a year ago. And it's the investigation results. And I'm not, we have separate sections to go over them, but I just wanted to give you kind of a quick, uh, quick overview. This is the poster that we presented. It has an objective, which we've actually already talked about. And then I'm going to go ahead and Sarah, just give me the next slide and we'll talk about other parts of this. So the nuts and bolts of the study, because that's an important piece of any study. How is it put together? Uh, and so we uh, wound up with 17 volunteers. And this was out of the, our existing group. And we uh, had, we collected our data for 10 months. So it was during our face-to-face -face season and also during our seasonal break. So we could sort of get an idea of whether a tracker made any difference when we weren't meeting. So you get, when you look at this little device, you, it has, a has your time, time of day, so you don't have to have a watch on. And it also gives you your step count. So it's very easy to check your step count and see whether you've taken steps today. That data, and this is the, more the part that Chris just alluded to, it has to get set up in the beginning. Once it's all set up, it's, it goes by itself, but you'd have to set it up. It syncs with your smartphone and it also syncs with the company's platform. And in this case, we are using a Garmin. I didn't want to uh, say too much about any particular uh, device. Fitbit is very popular, but we did not go with a Fitbit because they did not have an inexpensive device that would also be waterproof and didn't require charging. And I thought this was a good decision in the beginning. I said, we want something that's really simple. So those are key issues. And we wound up with 17 volunteers, as I said. So we can go on to the next slide, Sarah. So we, uh, of our group, I've already described our group and you've seen some pictures of our group. And it turns out that as a group, we had limited tech experience. Uh, everybody was very engaged. I give a shout out to the Parkinson disease community. They are ready to, to new, learn new things but the prior experience was very limited. So we had some issues getting started, but we got started. Uh, I would definitely think if we want ever to start something at Parkinson Foundation to make a really simple tracker, I have a lot of good ideas about how we could simplify this tracker. Um, and, but this, and the sync issues were something of an issue for some people. So there were some challenges, but once we were started, we were, we were set to go. Uh, so that part, that part we resolved pretty early on. And so now onto the next slide, we'll look just briefly at our results. One of the important things I want to focus on here, we did this for 10 months. We tracked this for 10 months. 
There were only a few glitches along the way. There was one that got lost, but remember these were not super expensive. So we just had a reserve, one in reserve. We just took it out of the box. That was easy. Um, we had, um, we wound up with, it was people just accepted it. In fact, we had a student who was working with us at one point and he said, oh, I prefer this to my fit, to my more complicated device because it's so simple. We actually wound up with only 13 volunteers in the end. One person became ill. There were a couple of people who had issues with keeping their smartphones charged. And one person said, oh, I don't care about keeping, my, keeping in touch with everybody. I just look at it myself. Fantastic. Uh, but we didn't include him in our study because we didn't actually have his data. But he said he was an enthusiastic uh, adopter of this technology. One of the people moved away to Indiana after we'd started the study and we were able to stay in touch with him. That was terrific. We were, as I said, we were interested in seeing whether there were seasonal differences in the step count. Did the face-to-face -face meetings versus the, the break time meeting? No seasonal differences. That was kind of interesting. We also did a survey to find out what people had to say about their trackers. The results were uniformly positive. They found it interesting. They found it important. And so that is, um, you know, that I think is, is an important dimension. There, were, there, was no, there was no one who said, oh, it wasn't worth it, didn't like it, no one. Um, it's important for us to know that. So that's kind of the different pieces of our poster, of our results and our experience. And so Sarah, show us again, here is the whole poster, which I actually stuck up on the wall behind me. And I would like to take this opportunity to, to introduce the spokesperson for uh, this project. And this is Wendy Lang. She has been a participant since the beginning. She is a very, she brings enthusiasm to everything she does, which I think is a wonderful thing, Wendy. And uh, she will talk to you very briefly about her experience and, uh, and what she has to say about it. Hello, everybody. Um, I had a great experience with this. I'm the kind of person I just love to look at numbers and, and compete with myself. I do, I do so much more exercise with this tracker. It's a fantastic tool. Uh, I was not much of an exercise person before. If, if I could go horseback riding and the horse did the work, that was better for me. But when I, when I got diagnosed with Parkinson's, I knew I had to exercise and this was wonderful. Here's my tracker, I'm still doing it. And I will continue using it. Um, I'm finding it a little bit difficult with COVID to get the exercise I need, but it still helps. It helps motivate me. It's a great motivator. And as has been said many times, it's, you can use it. Uh, it's waterproof. And I used the, when uh, COVID wasn't happening, I was in the pool uh, three times a week and that was, went with me. And not having to worry about charging was also a plus. And I love connecting with my uh, cell phone. So it's been a very positive experience for me. Thank you, Sarah. Here, you're muted. Myself unmuted, there I am. All right, yeah, no, thank you, Wendy. And, and thank you for sharing your enthusiasm uh, throughout. Um, so Wendy said it's a wonderful tool. Uh, I think that it is a very, it's certainly a very useful tool and we should probably continue investigating uh, and see what more we can do with it. Uh, the issue of accountability comes up a lot in the context of what motivates people. And, uh, you know, if you have a team and your team is expecting you and you don't show, you feel, oh, I really should do it. This is also part of accountability. And as I said, there was one person who found accountability to himself was all that he really cared about. Um, and so some people shared and some people didn't share. Chris was looking things up. Uh, we had one other person who was looking, at the, actually the partner of one of our patients, that she was always looking everybody up. Um, and that was terrific. But not everybody felt that way about it. Um, and so that's, you know, that it's, it's, it's flexible. You want to be accountable to yourself. You want to, in some uh, other uh, investigations of tracker technology in the workplace, they've had teams and they've had competitions. We didn't really go that route, but it's possible. And I think I already mentioned that it doesn't require face-to-face. -face. So you can stay in touch with your free teammates even if they move to Indiana. Um, so uh, let us just carry on here. 
Oh, I wanted to talk, I want to need a shout out. I want to shout out to the research participants and particularly to the Parkinson Foundation for supporting a range of research and activities. I know we really are all very, very hoping for the cure, but in the meantime, there's things that we can do. And I think the Parkinson Foundation has done a terrific job of keeping all of those things in mind. And so what I would like to do now is, uh, so yes, I couldn't, of course, provide a, a presentation without reference list. And so there is, as you know, there's a terrific literature on the importance of exercise. Um, and the evolutionary history of humans explains why physical activity is important. Obviously, our distant ancestors had to do a lot of exercise. And this is sort of a general, this is a general rather than a specific. There's definitely also been specific studies of individuals with Parkinson's disease looking, I think you know, many of you have heard my colleague Giselle Petzinger who studies from the perspective of how does your brain look if we are a mouse and we dissect you later and you've been exercising, it looks better. So uh, I think we have one more slide that covers, covers references. Um, there are, some of these are primary resources and some are secondary resources. And there's still a lot we want to learn about whether we need high intensity interval training or whether we want uh, moderate pace. Um, but there is uh, an abundance of research that says exercise is good for us. So if a tracker is helpful, um, it is, it's worth giving it a try. I recommend for those of you who are um, able to do so, there are trackers that track a lot of stuff. Uh, I belong to a team of the quantified selfers, the people who measure everything. But um, that's, that's, another, that's another dimension. And so with that, I would like to now take some questions. I saw that there were some questions and I'd like to take some questions and see what we can do with those. Absolutely. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah and Chris and Wendy, your enthusiasm and great information. This is just so wonderful and so valuable to all of us. Um, we definitely will move into the Q&A session next. I um, mean, at this point, um, I'll just make the reference again for everyone who has logged in. Uh, feel free. We'd love to uh, check out if you want to turn your camera on. That would be wonderful. Uh, it's the com Parkinson's community supporting one another. So I am going to start off and I'll try and spread our questions around here. So, um, and I apologize if I'm turning a little bit. Um, can you give us some examples of the types of fitness, tra fitness trackers? Uh, not as an endorsement as such, but perhaps um, as it really pertains to what you have been talking about. Uh, for instance, if I need something waterproof or something that can be used with a walker because my arms aren't swinging. So Sarah, could you start us off with that question? Sure. There are, as I'm sure you're well aware, there are all sorts of trackers. Let me address first the arm not swinging one because that comes up a lot. And uh, this, the tracker that we are using, actually it's a, it's a fits in a little band and you can fit it into a smaller band that ties onto your shoelaces. And people have done that uh, if you're taking steps. Uh, we also had a participant who actually mostly got his exercise on his bicycle. So he also used his, and it was actually able to use his tracker uh, attached to his shoe. So, uh, and they come with different, they come with little, you buy them on Amazon for very little money, different kinds of ways to attach these things to you. And if anybody ever wants to contact me, I feel free to share my email, which is the best. And I'm happy to direct people to actual uh, sites where you can purchase stuff. Um, as, you, as I said, we, we focused on things that were relatively inexpensive. Uh, Apple watches, as you know, have now gotten to be quite sophisticated and wonderful uh, and expensive. Uh, they're cheaper than they used to be, but they are much more expensive than the simple device that we are using. So your budget actually will somewhat determine what you get. And your, phys your, your manual dexterity is another consideration. So if you're having challenges with pressing little buttons, 
I, I recommend that you shop for something very simple. And I'm happy to tell you what we actually wound up with, although I don't want to sound like a commercial for anything. Um, we look Sarah, at let me introduce, uh, interrupt you for a moment just sure. to reiterate that actually uh, s several people have asked directly for that information. So uh, perhaps no one sees it as an endorsement, but simply you sharing the information from this research of what the model was. So that would be fabulous. So this is a Garmin. And Garmin, as you know, does a range, they have a very high end devices for serious athletes. And this is their Vivo Fit 3. And anybody who wants to get more information, as I say, share my email with anyone who has a question about specifically how to, because Garmin makes a, quite a few of these, but this one costs about 50 bucks on Amazon. And it's the, and it's the waterproof uh, one that doesn't require any charging. <laughs> has a watch type battery in it. And once a year, I put a new watch battery in. So I would be happy to share the specifics because it is the Vivo 3, but there's, there's, other, there's the two and there's the junior and there's, I'd be happy to give you the specifics. Um, and I always wish that Garmin would sponsor us a little bit and give us some free ones. So maybe we should uh, work on that too. Yeah, that would be terrific. So let me, di let me talk a little bit about Fitbits and why we do not use a Fitbit. Um, and you may notice, I'm going to even say something else. You may have noticed that Amazon has come out with a new Halo. The Halo only requires that you charge it once a week. And some of the Fitbits, the low-end Fitbits, only require that you charge it once every four or five days. And I prefer, and I definitely sense that for, for the group of people that I was exercising with, charging once a year was much better. So, um, that's my perspective, but it does depend on your own manual dexterity. That's really, you know, if you don't mind plugging the Fitbit, the Fitbit is also, I've had people tell me, they said the bands for the Fitbit are much better. So that's a, that's a consideration. If you, you know, the sure. fashion bands are much better for Fitbits. And Sarah, it might be because of our community, our technology here. Could you repeat one more time slowly Yes. the name, the model, the Garmin model name and number that you sure. use for this. If you could do yes. that slowly, that would be great. And I haven't even bought one in the last six months. So it's, and they changed the models. So I, I apologize that we start, when we started this investigation, it was the Garmin, which is a very common one, G-A-R-M-I-N. And they maintain a platform that aggregates results for you, as does Fitbit, and as do several, a Halo and several other things. Uh, so it's Garmin and it's the Vivo Fit three, but I will check that out. If anybody wants to, yeah, thank you, Sarah. If anybody wants to um, make sure that I'm giving accurate information, they're free to email me, please. And so okay. we'll get it. Yeah. Excellent. And, you know, this gets you at least pointed in the right direction. Absolutely. For something like an economic Absolutely. option. And as people can evaluate what they'd like to do on their own. Of course. They have. There's, there's, a huge, there's a huge range. And so I like to sort of help you narrow it down. Um, and, and they come out with new, new models periodically. So um, that's- Sir, that's can, you, can you address how the smartphone plays into all of this? Do you need a smartphone to use a, a activity tracker? So you don't need a smartphone. If you want to share, you need a smartphone basically. So your smartphone, what you do is, we sat down and Chris and Wendy can, are my witnesses here. We sat down and at first I thought we could do this as a group. And we sort of did, and for some people, but it's much easier one-to-one. -one. Somebody sit down, you bring your smartphone, your, I bring the device and we sit down and we get it set up. So that will allow you to easily share it with your group. And I wanted to share it because I was doing a study. So I didn't want, to ask people to write down how many steps they took today. And by the way, I didn't even, no, no one would do that. Who, would, who has time? Um, but as I say, one of the people who actually was excluded from the analysis because we didn't have his results, he said, oh, I don't need to share. I'm just looking at every day and I just check how many steps I've taken. So he didn't, he, not only did he not need it, he didn't want it. Who, need, who needs that? I just, I'm accountable to myself. So, um, so that's okay. sort of the, yeah. But I so need to for my the, study. The smartphone would be if you are going to be part of a group and you're sharing, but it's perfectly fine to have a wearable tracker that is 
independent of any smartphone and it's something that informs the person using it. The reason, other reason you want the smartphone. So if, if you, and, and um, the other thing that it does for you, it lets you look up, it, it's that you just, even if I don't share it with the Garmin platform, I can look up and see how many steps I took today, yesterday. It gives me a monthly calendar. Mm -hmm. Okay. All sleep. So there are advantages to just pairing it with your smartphone. Um, and uh, we even paired it with some not very smartphones. So, you know, smartphone, you don't have to have the latest model. If you have any kind of smartphone that's mm, five years old or even more, we actually were successful in getting them paired up so that the, the individual could look up on your phone. Then there's a little icon on your phone and you can look that up and you see, oh my goodness, this month I didn't take as many average steps as I did last month. So it tells you a lot. Okay, sounds like yeah, that you could really but get have much data. Um, can I add something here? Yes. Sure. Um, so I think someone mentioned, well, how reliable is the data? Um, and so I just wanted to comment you know, I would look at it, but I realize it's not exactly precise. And one thing I found out is, you know, one of the other people in our group, she always had many more steps. And I'm like, how do you get that many more steps? And she says, I take small steps. So there's a lot of different variables that go into it. So she would always be a little ahead of me and I'd be like, how'd you do that? But she took smaller steps so it would add up faster. So yeah, it's like not quantifiable, but I think it's kind of an idea of where you stand in relation to everybody else. And with me for sleep, my um motor specialists would always say you don't sleep enough and i'm thinking well and i looked at the bell curve and i was really on the lower end so to me that again motivated me to say i should try to get more sleep so in terms of it being exact uh, precise data i would say you know it's good to an extent it's kind of an overall picture of where you might stand in relation to other people and yourself so Okay, excellent. Yeah, when you set it up, it actually asks you for your height and your weight and so forth so that it somewhat calibrates. But this is, we were using this primarily as a motivator. There are much fancier devices that will measure a lot of things for you um, and that will help you determine whether the medication that you're taking uh, needs to be adjusted, will help with that decision. So there, there are, ours was for a specific purpose, but uh, there are other trackers of various sorts that are, have other purposes in mind and are more accurate. Okay, great, thank you. Um, Chris, could you tell us how one gets involved in a clinical trial such as this? And maybe even a little bit about your payer advocacy role? Um, so this one was easy because the whole group sort of was invited to participate. Um, I think, you know, and as an advocate, we're always trying to figure out how to get people involved. Um, luckily, when I was first diagnosed about 10 years ago, they convinced me to get involved in this pill study. And for me, I was hesitant at first, but it was great because I got to know the staff at where I was uh, getting started in my Parkinson's adventure. And um, there was a lot of interaction at the beginning because there was a lot of blood pressure testing. I was going once a week. And so I got to know everyone well and know the place. So that convinced me, and that's what I try to let other people know is, you know, it's, it's a little bit scary every time you think about doing this, especially if it's a pill here, it wasn't, you know, quite as, um, not as much risk involved. But I think if you think about it long-term and realize that everyone in the research uh, programs are there trying to find uh, um, some answers, and if you can participate that and you're comfortable enough, go ahead and do it. Um, and I think as fellow Parkinson's patients, we should encourage other people to look into it and see if it's something that might be the right fit for them. Excellent. Thank you so much. Wendy, a question for you now. Um, do you think the accountability of the tracker helps to keep you motivated? And maybe if there are other things that help to keep you motivated to exercise, we'd love to hear about your, your thoughts on that as well. Yes, well, I found that this tracker really motivated me. Uh, I would, I, you can set up a goal when, you, when you're setting up the, uh, the watch or the tracker. You can set up a goal like 6,000 steps a day or 10,000 steps, whatever you want, what's good for you. You can measure your steps. And getting that constant feedback was really good for me and very motivating. I, if I couldn't get enough steps outside because of the weather or something, 
I'd be walking in my hallway back and forth trying to get my steps up. So yes, it was a great motivator. Um, uh, also, I was able to take it in the pool and I, I did a lot of exercises in the pool and including walking in the pool and that mm -hmm. counted also. So yes, it's, it's just wonderful. I tend to be a little bit, uh, oh, I guess, um, I just really like the numbers. I like the numbers game and it helps. So the, the fitness answer? tracker really um, emphasizes that for you to the yeah. point where bad weather, you found a, a workaround. The weather yeah, wasn't cooperating, so you walked inside. Also, I use it on my stationary bike. Oh, okay. That's a great example. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, Sarah, what um, does this type of research mean for Parkinson's disease care? Um, is the hope that it will inf eventually inform and provide information for my doctor? For, I'm sorry, finish the, uh, say the end of that again, Nancy. So how does this research inform Parkinson's disease care? And does any of this information that is collected, could it help my doctor help me manage my disease? Doctor, yes, now that is, that is the, that's a very important question. And uh, let me just say, I want to take, uh, make one additional comment about Wendy. If you set a goal for yourself on this device, which is very easy to do, it gives you a little goal ding every time, every day when you reach your goal. So there's other little things. Uh, this is, that's on the issue of individual accountability. On the issue of sharing with your doctor, uh, you may have read that the new Halo, which has been released by Amazon, is going to con it's got, got some sort of a collaborative uh, agreement with Cerner that would allow the information from your device to get into your Cerner health record if you are using Cerner. Uh, and that, but that's the first step. We don't have very many, um, very many ways for this data to easily be transmitted to your doctor. Now, I like to think that neurologists are very, very interested in your exercise program and that you can then tell your doctor by average steps over the last, if you're using your, your phone, my average steps over the last period of time were such and such, or yesterday I went such and such a distance. And you can then anecdotally report that. We are just, be, just getting to the point where uh, we are, and it's definitely an issue of interest. How do we share between the individual fitness trackers that are all over the world with the electronic record silos that are all over the world? Because that is, uh, that is, a, that is a big issue. And um, at the moment, I would say you have to share your information with your physician. I always love it when folks with Parkinson's disease share with medical students, which has been an opportunity they've had sometimes uh, because that's a, an impressionable group. But right now we don't have that worked out. And, um, but there will, be, there will be much more action on that front. You named a couple of challenges there. And I wonder, um, in any of your discussions or research, have you explored any of the potential privacy issues? You know, if people are using this technology, it's personal health data. Um, have you come up uh, to any discussions yet about protecting privacy? There are ongoing tremendous discussions about protecting privacy. And I think, actually, I'm gonna say that question is too hard for me. I think that it is important to have some basic safeguards. I do think that step count data and sleep data for Parkinson disease individuals who are struggling with Parkinson disease, I think that being able to share it with your doctor it sort of is more important than what if someone in a foreign country wanted to find that out? I'm of the, I, I'll tell you, my, I have a bias, which is that are, there's certain things that need to be kept very carefully under wraps and other things that are probably less, um, less of a big deal. And we don't have any way yet in our world of separating out your step count from your mental health issues. So, um, so that's, that's a big issue and it will be, it will be adjudicated in other forums. And I, it's very hard. It's very hard. So, um, uh, so I, however, would love it if the Parkinson Foundation would uh, collect something pretty, pretty neutral, like step count data. 
I think that would be, that, I think that's, you'd get people who would be more willing to share that than to share their entire health record. Sure, absolutely. Well, we're happy to pass along that recommendation and of course, encourage you to pass it along as well. Um, I was just wondering in terms of user friendliness, uh, whether it's the Garmin or perhaps a different model, um, for helping people figure out how to collect data on sleep or to understand all the many things that a fitness tracker can do, because it relates so much to movement, which of course is what we're all about here, trying to solve this mystery. Um, are there, do the companies that sell these devices, do they have training videos for people? Can you get information so that you're not alone in trying to figure it out? Because I could see where that could be kind of daunting. Sure, so, it is. Suggestions on, on that? Um, I think what we need to do, Nancy and Sarah Osborne, I actually think we need to have a little uh, page on the Parkinson Foundation site that gives some of the basics. Because as I said, it starts number one with your budget. Do you need a budget? You know, can, can, you, can you buy an Apple Watch? And then do you have the manual dexterity that's gonna make it easy for you to use a more complicated technology? And so we could make just a one page these are sort of the basics. Here's what you can do with some, with his budgetary considerations. Here's your physical challenges considerations. Uh, and, you know, just uh, for, for starters, I would be happy to participate with you and develop that kind of a very basic resource, bearing in mind that it will change all the time. And that um, I think that we have to bear in mind it will change and that there's a range, a tremendous range of things. This is certainly turning into uh, quite the webinar where we have uh, such a leading expert offering to do even more and more, and we are very grateful for that. Um, one other question, and um, I know in my office I've been getting calls about this, and, and I'm guessing our helpline is as well, and we can put our helpline number in here. So are there virtual support groups, um, any information you have on, on those? And, can anyone participate in your 5K team, Sarah? Uh, the answer, the short answer to the participation is yes, although we are, and so I haven't yet worked out the details of our season. It's just cooling off in Los Angeles. We never have tried to exercise during the heat of the summer. And of course we've had bad air quality uh, to go with it. So it's been a bit of a, it has been, no one's, no one's ready to start, but it's just cooling off. Um, and so what we need to do is actually develop a, program where we get together out of doors and live stream at least our looseners. We start every session with some exercises that are called looseners by our coach. And we need to uh, live stream those so that we can actually open the 5K training team to whoever and wherever. But that, that remains to be seen. If you're in Los Angeles, you're, uh, be in touch with me. We're, about, we're gonna start within the next few weeks, resume. Okay. And, and of course, many of the uh, individuals participating today are from all over the country. And right. so I know we, we had some yeah. folks uh, from Canada and beyond as well. So that would uh, be really helpful. And you're so generous to offer your contact information, Sarah. So that can be provided in the follow-up email, which right. everyone can Thank you. Because this is, this is, as, as you know, I've been doing this for a long time and it's very uh, dear to my heart. Absolutely. You are such a supporter of the foundation of the Parkinson's community and we so appreciate that. And I think that pretty much wraps up our questions for today. Um, on behalf of everyone, great, great appreciation, gratitude to not only Sarah Ingersoll, uh, Chris and Wendy, thank you so much for participating with us today and sharing your experiences uh, we are all about being the voice of the Parkinson's community, and that can only happen uh, with participation of people with Parkinson's. So thank you very much. If you have a question, if you had a question today that wasn't answered, uh, please know that we provide a ton of free resources, including our website, parkinson.org, educational book series, which there are many webinars, which you can uh, view live or go back and see what has been saved, podcasts, and of course, uh, check out Aware and Care, which is our hospital safety bag. If you are not aware of that, I really encourage you to request one. You can do that by contacting our helpline, 1-800-4PD-INFO, 
or you can go online also in our uh, website, parkinson.org, and you can leave a message, request information from our helpline as well. So that does it for today. I wanted to also share with you that uh, next week, I hope you'll be able to tune in for PD Generation. And that is in fact uh, an initiative of the Parkinson's Foundation. What have we learned so far about uh, genetics and Parkinson's? The PD Health at Home program features an expert speaker explaining how PD Generation, I know that might sound funny, but that's the point there. It's PD Generation findings will impact clinical research related to Parkinson's. And uh, special guest next week will be Dr. Roy Alcalé from Columbia University, who's really pivotal in uh, the PD generation effort. So that's next Wednesday, September 30th, 10 a.m. Pacific time, 1 p.m. Eastern time. And you can go to parkinson.org slash PD health to register. Uh, and you can register for multiple programs. Next one. And be on the lookout. We have something a little bit different for October planned. So we uh, once again encourage you to check those out. See us at um, parkinson.org slash PD health. Um, and I encourage you to do the mindfulness program on Mondays and Fitness Fridays. So until then, thank you again, everyone, for joining us today. Stay well and be in touch with us. We look forward to seeing you on more webinars. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.